thank, thank you everybody. I'm really, really glad to be here. And today we're going to talk about, mostly about selfies and the impact of selfies on um, people's sexual and intimate lives. But we're going to look at selfies from a little bit of a different perspective. Selfies is a design object and a design process. So first, keyboard the wrong place. <laughs> <laughs> so first I want to look a little bit at the history of selfies as a form of portrait. So first forms of portrait were found um, in Egyptian funerals, but they were not mass production, they were just limited to several cases. Influenced people who have died. And then the, the form of portrait started flourishing in the Byzantine Empire and the Roman Empire and where they were mass produced on coins. So from individual we start getting to coins. Um, they had in the Byzantine Empire two ways of reproducing coins and these two, la two ways of reproducing portraits and coins were limited to a number of people that were, um, that were trained in the craft. So I want you to, to look at the progression of how the distribution of portraits praises with the centuries. Then we go to the Renaissance and we have portraits that are painted by artists. So we have more people that can reproduce portraits um, compared to you know, the Roman Empire. And then we have a um, breakout point with the photography portraits where um, the portraits could be mass reproduced but again we have limited number of people that can do photography. And then we go to our selfies. Who is the producer of selfies? Yourself. Everyone. Everyone. <laughs> so from a couple of people that were trained in producing coins, we go to everybody. Okay. So why is this important? When we have everybody involved in a process, we demo democratize it, right? So everybody can produce selfies. This is a democratic process. So we democratize the process, but what else do we democratize? <coughs> what do you think? It's an ultimate democratization of something. We all can do it. Right, we take our selfies, almost with no exceptions. So what do we democratize? Yeah, but what's behind it? Why do we take selfies? Yeah? Like ourselves? That's a very, very good point. Let's start from there. We democratize ourselves. What about ourselves do we democratize? Yeah, what else? Why do we post selfies? And why do we have so many types of selfies? We have the selfies like this, <laughs> and we have the selfies, yeah? Different representations of our own selves. Very good. Are, yeah. yeah. So, in my presentation, I keep on like, I guess a few of the keyboard is down there, so I keep on. So, in this presentation, I argue that Selfies democratize the way we tell the stories of our lives. And not only the story as a final result, as a biographical reference, but the process of telling the story too. So we democratize both the final result and the process within which we tell the stories of our lives. Why telling stories is important? We all love stories. We can't survive without stories. The way we perceive the external world is by uh, putting the details within the story so it makes sense in our heads. Have you heard of uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau? The Genevan philosopher, the social contract? He had, he had a very interesting life, very controversial. He was enrolled, involved in lots of conflicts a lot of controversies and at the end of his life he writes a book called Confessions where he explains all the controversies surrounding himself and he says 
I think my audience and my followers will benefit from it. Why? He asks. Because then my audience will realize that I'm no different than anybody else. So that's very important. Like he, he says, I'm unique, but at the same time, I'm no different than anybody else. And what he says is that there is no way of somebody, of, of somebody telling the story of somebody else. We can only know another person by surface appearances. We can only know ourselves. And we can only tell the stories of ourselves. So how does this relate to selfies? So we need, in some way or another, we need to um, express ourselves and to share our stories. And um, in the past, this was done by writing. But writing, what's the difference between telling a story by writing and telling our story by taking a selfie? What are the benefits of the selfie? Excuse me? Not very much skill. Not very much skill. This is very good because writing takes skill, right? And there's still a lot of illiterate people around the world. So can they tell their stories? Orally, yes. But it's not very durable in time. I tell you a story, you get out of the classroom and you forget it, right? <laughs> OK, what else? So it doesn't take skill. That's a very good one. What else? Yeah. So my point here is the benefits of the selfie are it's instant. It doesn't take away from the moment. When we write, we need a lot of time. A paragraph will take us 10 minutes at least. And this takes away from the moment. But the selfie is a click away. You click and you're still in the moment, still there, right? Um, the other person that, it's actually not Rousseau, it's Montaigne, it's a French uh, Renaissance philosopher. He says that if we look at people as individuals within a crowd, we will realize that people are very similar, right? I'm a person at the biological level. I function as any of you. Um, there might be some slight difference, but in general, we're the human species, you know, quite similar to each other. He says, if you look at these people within the crowd, we realize that we're the same. What makes the difference between people is when we delve into the relationship between people. Then we understand the differences between them. And he says, he gives this example, it's a fascinating example. It's like, I love my, my wife. And if I look at her within a group of females, she'll be one of them, no difference. But I love her because we have a distinguished relationship. So we distinguish between people by you know, establishing some relationships and defining these relationships. So what happens with the selfie? How is the selfie different than somebody else taking our photography, our, our image? Yeah? Someone else might see like a better image or a better version of yourself than what you think is the perfect version of yourself. Yeah. What else? It's yeah? Personal because you're the one actually taking the image. So we, that's, that's an excellent point. So we, by taking our selfies, we are getting rid of the multiplicity of relationships that can, that can be established between the person that takes the photograph and the subject of the, of the photograph. For example, if I take a picture of you, all of you here, if you don't like me, you have a fake smile. Okay? <laughs> if I don't like you, it, it happens very, sub, very often and subconsciously. Like people that don't like the, the person that they're taking a picture of cut, let's say, you know, half of their head. And it's all a, mi a mistake. It's subconscious. It's not conscious. But we do. Like these relationships influence the way we take the image. While in selfies, there is no mediation. There is no human relationship. Like in there is no interhuman relationships. We still have relationships with ourselves. but. Anyway, so for me, this is an ultimate democratization of the process. It's instant. We tell our story because we need, that's how we function. We need to tell a story. And especially, we need to tell the stories of our lives. And we are not an, 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 a subject or an object of interhuman relationships. It's just us. OK? So for me, telling a story, telling the story of our lives is an ultimate design process. When we tell a story, we design 
Um, it's a sequence, we design what gets in and out of the story, we design where it will take place, who will get involved, how it will be presented. Okay? So, have you heard of Donald Norman? When I was studying him, he was called the father of design theory. Now my students tell me that he's the grandfather of design theory. <laughs> um, so, he's the first one to actually deal with the psychology of design. And he says that the design process involves several levels of actions. First, the first action is we establish goals. The second action is we uh, get the intention to act. Then we have ex execute a sequence of actions. No, so we, we establish the sequence of action, actions, then we execute them. And then once we're ready with our design product, we give it out to the world. So what happens here in this diagram as the world is us, the ordinary citizens that consume the design products. And all these processes to here are reserved for the designer. So we're, you know, there's a designer which is up there. Look at even the hierarchy of the diagram. We're down here. Up there is the designer. So, you know, we're of no importance, the users. So what happens to me with self is, is that the democratization of the design process, of the design of the mediated body, of the design of our stories, actually becomes bottom up. I just, you know, reverse his diagram. So we're here, we're the grass, right? Multiple millions of people having intention to act, getting the sequence, you know, what kind of selfie should they take? And then executing it, there are multiple millions of YouTube videos telling you how to, to get to take the most successful selfie, the sexiest selfie, and so on. That. And then we give it out to the world, right? Facebook or whatever sharing platforms. So see, from here, being only the recipients of the design products, now we become actually the designers that give it out to the world. So we're not here at the bottom anymore. We're, you know, both here and here. We take over the whole process. And this is quite an important thing. So, this is a very interesting one. I, I um, it's actually, if you can see, there are some people here in the background and they are, they're both peeing. So uh, the <laughs> caption of this one was, uh, be careful uh, who is at the, uh, you know, at the background when you take selfies. So Norman again talks about affordances of the design project, pro, uh, of the design object, and his definition of affordance is, user's perception of possibilities for some action. So he says, if you see a handle, it should be intuitive that you're just able to take it and lift it. And it should match the shape of your hand and should be intuitive what you should be doing with it. Okay? So he sees the affordances only in the final result, in the design object. I argue that when it's selfish, we get also affordances within the design process. Okay, so for me this is the difference. We're now involved in the design process and the design process also has a lot of offers, a lot of affordances. For example, why would you choose to take a selfie alone? What, what are the affordances of this situation? Being able to, you know, get a picture of yourself without anybody interfering with the process. Yeah? You can frame it the way you want to. You can frame it the way you want to, yeah. Will we be able to pose like this in front of a, a photographer with a camera? Probably most people will not be able to do it. <laughs> I said maybe. I don't know. I, I'm not judgmental, but you know, most of us are shy. Let's say it this way. What happens here? What's the affordance of this situation? Okay. So for me, the affordance is we can do whatever we want without having to consider possible relationships with other humans because we are alone. 
And this, of course, when we're alone, we're not the same person as, you know, when we're observed by 20 people. We can do whatever we want. And this is the affordance of the situation of being alone. And um, this is the democratization of the, within the process I'm talking about. Okay. So, do you see it clearly? Yeah. So all selfies are from Google Images, so they're publicly available. Um, Norman again talks about emotional design. And he says there are three levels of design. One is the, the most intuitive visceral, then behavioral, behavioral, and then reflective. So what happens here is, have you noticed like some product in the, let's say in the supermarket, a bottle of water. Some of them look really cool and you just grab it and others don't. What's the difference? What do we define as cool? When we see something cool, we know instantly that it is cool and we like it. But what, what, what does it make it cool? Yeah. It's unique in some way. What if it's too unique and you don't know what it is all about? What happens then? You know, you see something like extraterrestrial object and you don't know what it is. You know it's cool, but I don't know what it is. What happens then? Yeah? You get scared. Getting scared, so it's intimidating. Stay away. Yeah? Or you could just try to find more about it. <laughs> yeah. But would you interact with it without tr bef before trying to find what it's all about? Would you pay money if it's in the supermarket to get it? just for the thrill of it, like what is it going to be? Yeah? I may. <laughs> I may. I wouldn't. If it's above two dollars, I'm not getting it. Okay? So what Norman argues is that successful design decisions include all these three levels. The visceral is the one, the totally intuitive level. So if we smell something bad, we stay away because our body at a very visceral level gives us the impulse that, you know, this is probably poisonous. We stay away. And he gives an example of why people like, like symmetri symmetrical faces. So the most beautiful faces, there, there was a study that what people perceived as most beautiful was probably the most symmetrical faces. And he explains this with the evolutions and the survival of the fittest, okay? Uh, other things, smells. If it's good, we want it. If, if it smells bad, we don't want it. Visceral, if we see something sexy, a lot of us will want it, right? So this is the very visceral level. There is no thinking involved. We just like it or not. This is the first, the first reaction you get from an object or a subject. The second level is behavioral design, and this is all about use. So there is not a lot of thinking, but when I see a telephone, I know that its usability or its uses for me to call. When I see a handle, I pick it. Okay, so this is all about what can, how can we use the object. And then for me, the most interesting level is the reflective design. So this is all our cultural and um, previous associations that we can establish with an object. Okay, so um, if I see what is a if I see a rose, for example, you know, in many cultures, a rose is you know an expression of love. So. For me, a rose signifies love. So we build these connections, and for every person, these reflective connections are individual. So why are selfies so successful? Because they have all three levels. So visceral design, we see a sexy selfie, and we say, wow, I like it, it's sexy, right? Behavioral design, we can make use of it. We create stories in our mind. 
Um, we enjoy the aesthetics of it. So there are different uses of selfies. If we are the producers of selfies, we scratch our egos if we get a lot of likes and all of that, right? <laughs> so there is a lot of uses. And the best thing is that it's not one, just one uni use. We can embed a lot of uses into just, you know, an image. And then the reflective design. In order to build our egos, to build our personalities, we need to compare ourselves to the other. And, and selfies give us this opportunity, right? Oh, he's a male. I don't have a six pack. So I'm different, right? So we compare, we build our image, of, uh, build the images of ourselves by comparing uh, ourselves to others. So this is a part of the reflective design. Here we can, you know, we can read a lot into the messages that selfies are giving us in this specific example. I, I think there is a sexual message. You, if you think I'm wrong, tell me. Um, so the posture of the body, the tongue out. We can read a lot into that. So selfies are successful because they incorporate these three levels of design very, very um, intensely, let's say. OK, so this is, do you see, this is my image, Google image search result. So porn selfie. And I censored it. It was from down here, it was a full image. And from the first page of Google Images, I got only one male porn selfie. All of them were females. I don't know whether, you know, selfies are more, I don't know if women are more into selfies or Google search algorithms have been created to, you know, sell more of it. I don't know. I have no answer. <laughs> but I want to ask you, like, how do you see this democratization of the process of telling story influencing our intimate and sexual lives? What do you think? Yeah? Um, maybe instead of telling the story like to your friends or whatever, you'll show them a picture. Yeah, yeah. I can only think of that, the Richard Parsons case, right? Where oh. she's co host <coughs> and they're taking selfies while having sex with her. You know, the influence and the significance of that case for. So, what is the significance? Just I mean, isolate yourself from the case. Mm -hmm. What is the significance of this? There's not so much sexuality, it's more superficiality. Yeah, I would agree with that. What else? Do you think that porn selfies democratize sex in some way? Who was the producer in the past of, of por pornography materials? The adult industry itself. And who is behind the adult industry? Men. Men. OK, so yeah? I mean, I guess instead of having the big companies make all the videos, it kind of lets everyone take their own, kind of. Yeah, yeah. I think in a way, like, because you're talking about like, the democratization of, you know, of this kind of thing, um, in a way, it's almost like taking it back from, like, a predominantly male organized industry. And because the women are kind of telling their own sexual stories, if you will, it's actually kind of like a form of liberation, if you would, I think. I would agree, although I'll talk about the counter perspectives in my next slide. Anybody else? Okay, so um, let's go to the next slide. So about pornography, it was argued that pornographic materials were trying to address the sexual needs of men and they were produced from men, produced by men for men. And uh, a lot of feminists argue that actually porno pornographic materials do not address the needs of females. Um, 
And the conception of the feminist was that actually male, actually pornography materials were consumed predominantly by males. And I read a recent study which actually established that the consumers of pornography are 52% male and 48% women. So this posed a new set of questions. Like, if women are half of the consumers of pornography, shouldn't we also address the needs of the females? Okay? So, um, there are two feminists, totally anti pornography feminists. One of them is Katherine McKinnon, and the other is uh, Andrea Dworkin. They argue that pornography is totally putting women into an intimidating, derogative, and whatever position, like anything bad that you can think of is assigned to pornography. Of course, there are other feminists that say, um, well, this is not right. You know, women have the agency to decide what to watch and what not to watch and what to do about all these materials. So we have the agency to appropriate pornographic materials for whatever needs we we need. Some women would, would, would watch porn for you know visceral pleasures, other will watch porn to analyze it, third will watch it out of um, boredom. Boredom and so on and so on. <laughs> so we do have the agency to appropriate um, the content of the for pornographic materials. And I do not agree with um, the anti-porn feminists, because when they say, you know, women are put in totally derogative positions, they ignore that women have agency to decide what to do. Okay? So these argue that porn is produced in accordance with heteronormative rules. Do you know what heteronormativity is? Can you explain fast? <laughs> heteronormativity is the idea that basic, well, it's well, it's basically more like in a way um, from uh, well, I'll say this. it's it's basically like an ideology that states that you know that the norm is heterosexuality, but then heteronormativity has been so ingrained in Western society since time immemorial. Okay, so basically, society's heteronormativity says that societies prioritize hetero sexual relationships were within the frame of patriarchy. So it's males that decide what is appropriate and what is not within the domain of heterosexual relationships, okay? So my claim here is that by democratizing the way we tell our, the stories of our lives with the selfies, we have also democratized the domain of pornography. Because now women are equally able to create their own pornographic materials and to meet their own needs. Some will do it to find partners, others will do it to find sexual pleasures, third will do it of boredom, fourth group will do it for some completely different reasons. We are not to judge these. It's just the fact that we can appropriate and create pornographic materials that meet our specific needs, whatever these needs are. Once we democratize the realm of pornographic materials, we also normalize what has previously been considered, let's say, deviant sexual practices. Like if you think of homosexuality, till recently it was considered a deviant sexual practice. But by, but, but by publicizing it, by publicizing the discourse about it, now it is considered a normal sexual practice. So here, by normalization, that is a term by uh, Foucault. He says that by creating discourse around specific, specific practices, we normalize them. Okay? So uh, homosexuality has been normalized. I have other examples, but probably I'll skip. Okay? Um, and for me, the, the one specific application of, 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 of porn selfies is Craigslist casual encounters. <laughs> I see people, people laughing. Uh, I will not ask you, have you ever been there? Okay, so I'll tell you what it is. Um, you know what Craigslist is, right? Yeah. And there is personal 
a category of personal and there is like misconnections, men w seeking women, women seeking women, uh, women seeking men and so on. And there is a very interesting category which is called casual encounters where people are looking for just explicitly for sex partners and usually the selfies are porn selfies so there is no face there is just um, have you heard of the term digitalia so digital genitalia <laughs> becomes digitalia okay so Craigslist casual encounters the ads are very often accompanied by by digitalia and um, I, I think that the extent to which these have been popularized uh, would not have been possible without these technologies that, that allow us to take pictures of ourselves as we are without any other human relationship involved in it and um, without any external factors that may um, make us rethink the situation. Okay? And <laughs> questions? Okay, I guess I'm going to go. <laughs> yep. um, one question uh, more with the democratization of porn okay. and all that stuff. Um, one of the faster growing uh, categories of porn is amateur porn. And I'm, yeah. I'm wondering if you think that that's because of the democratization where people want to see real people aside from faker plastic sur surgery, all that, that type of people instead. Okay, first we have to make a distinction. There are two types of amateur porn. One is uh, the Pornographic, the adult industry is faking yes. porn, like low quality, you know, a lot of noise, just because there is a market demand for amateur porn. So I'm taking this away. So it's produced by the adult production, just imitating the qualities of an amateur porn. And I'm talking about amateur porn that's been created by amateurs, right? I, I totally, I, I think that uh, this is a result of the democratization both of the process of, you know, telling our stories and the result. Because now, most, you know, everybody has the means to produce amateur, amateur porn, while in the past, you know, we would need probably a camera, a third person, and not a lot of people would have opened up to do this, especially with the stigmas around you know such practices now that everything is getting normalized um, so it's a circular process actually we create more of this because we have the means of production of porn and by circulating it around we normalize it once it's normalized more people see it as a normal practice and create more amateur porn so it's a circular process and that's my answer is absolutely yes Anyways, okay, um, so uh, I guess you kind of uh, answered it a, a little bit earlier in the slides, but then, uh, like, yeah, now, nowadays it's kind of split between male and females who, like, uh, consume porn and everything. But uh, I follow uh, Vice News uh, online, and they, just a few weeks ago, they did, like, a really short documentary on, um, on like, th there's a new surge in Japan where it's, it's called, like, um, a female erotica or something. And um, it's essentially a porn targeted for women. And um, I guess like the, the distinct difference is is that it's it's more gentle, I guess, mm -hmm. like um, in comparison, I guess, with uh, other porn where it's just it's more aggressive. Um, like they, they interviewed they interviewed like one of the actors for um, for the uh, female targeted porn. And then he, he, he was describing describing himself that um, that like the reason why there's such like uh, a demand for uh, this new kind of like female targeted porn was because they have I guess the females would have something uh, more to well they they can relate more to like I guess the softness 
of uh, the, the female targeted porn, whereas like, uh, in his words, he said like, uh, with male, with the male porn, I guess, it's just all about power and like, just like, oh, like I, like I, I made her like feel good, like this was my doing kind of thing, whereas um, with the female uh, targeted porn, it's kind of like, it's more intimate and like you're making love, I guess. Um, but yeah, you can like, answer that. Like, there's like a whole well, there is um, to this specific genre, like female erotica. Yeah. There is um, marketing politics behind it, and some argue that it's again created by male. The way the the reason they put it into female erotica is to be able to sell it at normal stores, like you know chapters or. Um, you know, where, where else do they best buy and so on. So one of the, the major stimulus behind putting it into female, under female erotica and not porn is to just reach to wider markets and um, greater availability. So I, I know that the arguments around it, I, I'm, I'm quite suspicious about it. Um, they also call it education of female sexuality materials or whatever. <laughs> and it's again, you know, so that it can be sold in and, and, and more locations. So I'm, 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 I'm reserved. I don't say that probably there are, you know, for me the business argument, the marketing argument behind it is killing it all. So I, 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 I can't answer the question. Maybe like, I don't know. Um, let's see how I can work this. Um, well, some of the, one of the readings you were, you were kind of referencing of uh, Sarah Ahmed's uh, Cultural Politics of Emotion, she was talking about like these Freudian ideas of how, of, of how, how we have like narcissistic and anaclytic love and how we have these ideas of the, that the self is like an object of love or that, you know, there's the external object or these objects of love. And um, I was kind of thinking, you know, how with the, how there's like the, the design process that goes into when making a selfie of any kind or anything like that and how the labor and the satisfaction that you get out of it. I also wondered if perhaps you could argue that maybe selfies are in a way their own expression of love perhaps because like for casual encounters like on the Craigslist portion of it and how people basically pour, put up like their porn selfies in order to basically get a connection it makes me wonder like are they doing that so that it's almost like out of a could you argue maybe a narcissistic view or absolutely sure. like the self is always the self always comes first we can't isolate ourselves from, from ourselves, right? This is the way we perceive the world. The difference between a normal, um, a normal acknowledgement of the self is an, and the narcissist is a narcissistic self is that for normal people, we acknowledge the self, but we also have empathy for others. And be, with narcissistic persons, there is always the disinflated self and there is no empathy for the other. So it's only the self. Well, we are the self and the others, right? If you start crying, I'll be concerned, right? And this is a normal attitude. Um, so, of course, when we take selfies, there is, you know, it's a, it's a, a manifestation of the ego. We can't, I, I don't deny this in any way. Um, the thing is like we have to put a boundary between you know like what is normal what is socially acceptable and what you know if the narcissistic ego is totally taking over everything so um yeah of course it's an acknowledgement of the self and montaigne again said that writing about oneself as the biggest manifestation of the ego. So I think, you know, selfies are doing something very similar. And there is nothing bad about it because 
we need to put ourselves out there and let the world know. And in this way also Montaigne says we're doing a favor to the others by publicizing our own stories because they get the opportunity to compare themselves with somebody else. Okay? And this is the way we develop ourselves. I compare myself to you, I compare myself to Katie, I compare myself to whoever, and this is how I understand who I am. If I don't compare myself to anybody, I'll be something like Tarzan in the jungle, right? Okay. So I don't know if this answers your question. Okay. Yeah? Um, so I was reading uh, the book of Patel and eroticism and mm -hmm. sensuality. And one of the overarching themes that I noticed in the book was uh, the word of taboo. They mentioned yeah. it a lot, right? And so I Googled the definition of it, and it basically it said uh, prohibited and restricted by social custom. And the first example that I came up with was sex was a taboo a subject, right? Uh, and then in chapter five and six, there was two quotes. Uh, it said that taboo is there in order to be violated. And yeah. in chapter six, it also says it incites the desire and creates it. Yeah. But, um, like in a in a like in a public setting, obviously we wouldn't uh, really mention anything that's like related to sex because it's just awkward, right? But then in on in the online, like on the internet, people just um, they do whatever they want. They kind of like they post their like sex selfies and and there's also like pornography online. Do you think the taboo exists online, or is it kind of like okay both? Things that you mentioned about Bateo is that, that he explains it with the notion of transgression. So what he says is, what elevates human sexuality above animal sexuality is the notion that a boundary is being crossed. Okay, so animals reproduce and that is it. What creates desire in people is the thing that some boundary has been crossed. and. Um, a taboo is a boundary, so because if, if, if the taboo is crossed, then a boundary is being crossed and this in intensifies the desire, the eroticism of the situation. And um, there is another theory that explains the things you're talking about uh, by Gerard. He is a literary critic and he says that desires are never linear. So I want an, an object and if this object or subject is totally available and I can take it and consume it and do whatever I want with it, then I wouldn't desire it anymore. In order for the desire to exist, we need a third element that mediates the desire. And he explains it with Dostoevsky and Dostoevsky is always triangle relationship. So two men fall simultaneously in love with one woman. So both of them mediate the desire for themselves. So if this woman lady is available to one of them and the, other, and, and the one can consume her immediately, this is not going to, to create desire. But if there is somebody else that wants the lady too, this intensifies the desire. And this matches very well with Bateo's um, notion of transgression. So you know, if, we, if there is another element, some obstacle or somebody else that desires the same thing, then once we get it, we transgress this obstacle and that intensifies the desire. So what, is, what was your question? So what happens online if we... If we uh, um, I was basically asking if it exists online or is it just... Because you said the, in one of the slides it said that uh, sexual acts was normalized. So it's like, is it okay online? But well, we still have the, the, the norms, like, and yeah. um, like Belfies and so on. Um, it's again a transgression of what is socially acceptable. Like, you can't walk like this at Quantlon, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, again, we have this norm. You know, we can't, we can't walk like this in the streets. And we transgress it online. So we, we again have this, you know, transgression of some, of some norm. And that mediates it. And what happens again, the normalization is termed from Foucault. What happens again is the more we do it, the more we perceive it as normal. So these are like circular relationships. We can't isolate them from each other. 
this you know practice will get normalized if this type of outfit get normal gets normalized in society you probably would not see these selfies anymore online because it's normal like there is nothing special about this there is no boundary that's being crossed so why should I do it okay does this answer the question okay